Hello, I'm Rick Marshall, and welcome to Trusting God Through Tribulation. This is a verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Revelation, and tonight we're on lesson number one, which is an introduction to the book of Revelation. All scripture that will be quoted in this study will be from the New American Standard Bible. And, uh, I, you know, I've been studying the book of Revelation for a long time. Um, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and it seemed like back then there was a real hunger for studying the end times. Everyone I knew was reading and studying the book of Revelation. We were all sure that the, the Lord would come back at any moment, any day. Many of my friends made the decision to postpone getting married or delay starting a family because they were waiting for the Lord's return. Every day we would wake up and we would believe that today is the day the Lord will come for his church. In fact, we had a group of my friends who labeled themselves as the bachelor to the rapture. And their goal was to stay unmarried until the Lord came because they wanted to devote all their time and effort to proclaiming the gospel and being ready for the Lord when he returns. Um, you know, every day we believe the Lord was coming, and I still feel that way today. But I don't see a lot of people with that hunger any longer for end times study. Today, many people continue along day after day, never looking forward to the glorious return of our Lord Jesus. <clears throat> so I frequently ask people their thoughts on studying the book of Revelation. I've been told many times, well, we can't study that in Sunday school because it's too complicated. Uh, I get too confused while I'm reading it. Uh, it's too hard to study. Um, I agree it's full of meaning. <laughs> Believe me, it's packed with action and prophecy. <clears throat> and it can be overwhelming to try and understand. Um, but I wanted to pour my best effort into understanding what God's trying to reveal in this great book. Um, so maybe it's overwhelming, maybe it's difficult to understand, but at the same time, it's the most incredible story that, as a believer, that we can read. Um, it can be both depressing and uplifting at the same time. Uh, if you read the book of Revelation and you're not a believer, it can be very depressing. And if you read it and you are a Christian, it still might be depressing because you see the fate of the rest of the world. But at the same time, it's uplifting, uh, uplifting because you see that the Lord will <clears throat> come back for the church and take it to heaven with him, and we will spend eternity with the Lord. Um, so it can be depressing, it can be uplifting. It all depends on your point of view, really, whether you're reading this as a believer or an unbeliever. I believe that um, the best way to study the book of Revelation is just like studying any other book of the Bible. Start in chapter 1, verse 1, and work your way through the book. It helps keep everything in context, and chapter 1 also provides us <clears throat> with an outline of the book of Revelation uh, to guide us through our study. I do believe that studying the Word of God is very important for Christians. Um, and I believe that many times uh, the book of Revelation can be uh, taught in an overly complicated fashion, especially if people are prone to interpret uh, what they see every day as current events on their TV into what they read in the book of Revelation. So this study will be simple, it will be Bible-based, <clears throat> I will try not to read too many current events into the study. Uh, that's not my goal. My goal is to read the book of Revelation and to use it to understand what's happening in the world, but not necessarily to watch TV and take each one of those individual events and assign it to a place in the book of Revelation. Because um, I think using current events to interpret God's word forces us to interpret it from our own perspective, 
not God's perspective. This is his story, not our story. I plan on teaching this series as if it was a Sunday school class. Uh, every time I teach it, I'll learn something new. And I hope you'll learn something also. And there's going to be reading assignments with each class. Uh, the book of Revelation is a fantastic study. And it's very important to uh, keep everything in context. So we'll probably try and study the book in entire chapters at a time. And we will have the uh, chapter for the following study as our reading assignment for each class. So welcome to Christ's revelation to us. You know, the biggest lesson I've learned from studying the book of Revelation is that no matter how bad it gets, uh, and it's going to get worse than it is today, but no matter how bad it gets, God is always in control. Um, and God has provided us with the end of the story in the book of Revelation. And I know it's a little bit of a spoiler alert, but in the book of Revelation, he tells us how it ends. And it ends with the Lord winning. The Lord conquers evil, conquers Satan and the beast. And it's a... Uh, triumphal victory for the Lord. So let's look at the uh, introduction to the book of Revelation. Um, chapter 1 provides us with the basics. <clears throat> the first part of chapter 1 really does. So Revelation chapter 1 verses 1 through 5 says, this, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it. For the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. That answers a lot of questions. It provides us with the basics of what's going on with the book of Revelation. So what is the book of Revelation? Well, in verse 1, at the very beginning, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which he gave him to show to his bondservants, the things much as, which must soon take place. So what is it? It's God's unveiling of Jesus Christ to John the Apostle. Who's it from? It's from God and from Jesus, through Jesus to John. But in addition to John, who's it written to? Well, it's really written to all of us as believers, all of us as Christians. So where is it written? In verse 9, John says, I, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So John was exiled to the island of Patmos because of his faith in the Lord. And this is where the revelation took place, where it was revealed to him what was going to happen in the end times. Why was it revealed to John? Back in verse 1 it says, to show things that must soon take place. And how was it communicated? How was it revealed to John? Uh, in verse 1 he says, He sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John. 
So right off the bat, in the very beginning of the book of Revelation, the first five through nine verses, we understand the what, the who, the where, the why, and the how of the book of Revelation. It gives us all the basic information right up front. It's really a great uh, opportunity to understand what the book of Revelation means, what its desired outcome was, and who it was targeted to. The book of Revelation has a lot of ties to the Olivet Discourse also. Um, in Matthew chapter 4, we find a passage referred to as the Olivet Discourse. Jesus was nearing the end of his ministry here on earth with his disciples, and his disciples were really having a difficult time trying to understand what was going to happen to Jesus over the next few days. They had several questions for him, and while Jesus was on the Mount of Off all of his teaching, they asked him a question, they privately asked him a question. They asked him, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus had um, a great reply to them. Matthew chapter 4, verses 4 through 14. And Jesus answered and said to them, See that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened. For those things must take place, but that is not the end yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of the birth pangs. And then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. One of the issues we have as human beings is that individually we have a very short-term memory. <clears throat> we typically only remember back to what we've experienced in our short lifetime. When people ask who the greatest baseball player of all time is, you know, Cardinals fans or Dodgers fans or Giants fans will typically look back and think of those players they saw play in their lifetime. So some will say, oh, Ozzy Smith was the greatest shortstop of all time. Or, uh, you know, that Mark McGuire or Barry Bonds could sure hit home runs. Uh, but really, you know, you have to look way back beyond our lifetime and consider people like Babe Ruth and Ted Williams and Ty Cobb and Stan Musial and, and all these other players before you can really come up with the greatest of all time. Um, so when we begin to analyze the Olivet Discourse, we have to understand that, uh, you know, yes, the times that we're living in are bad times, and the world to us seems to be spinning out of control. But this is the nature that we have living in a fallen world. My parents and grandparents thought the same thing in the world they grew up in. People throughout history have always felt the same way. An example to look at might be sickness and disease. Many of us believe that cancer or AIDS is killing people around the world in unheard of epidemic proportions. And the suffering caused by these two health problems is huge, and many lives are ruined by them. But looking purely at numbers, these really don't compare to some of the historical sicknesses we've had throughout history. Um, the worst case of the plague was the plague of Justinian from A.D. 500 to A.D. 650. Um, 
The plague left three of every five inhabitants dead. Entire cities were emptied out. And it wasn't until the ninth century that the world began to recover. The bubonic plague was also known as the Black Death. It killed as many as 100 million people from 1347 to 1351. Again, cities were devoid of people. Um, in our own minds, the only thing we have to compare AIDS and cancer with are the health problems we've witnessed through our lifetime. And that's why they seem like such enormous problems, and they are. Um, but the same thing goes with the difficult times we're going to go through. Um, we have an enormous amount of suffering ahead of us. And Jesus provides in this Matthew chapter 24 an outline of what's going to happen. Um, as a follower of Christ, I believe that uh, we will endure many difficult times as the world heads towards tribulation. But I believe that the church will be removed from the earth and be in the presence of our Lord before the tribulation period begins. What Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 24 isn't the tribulation, but I think it's the events leading up to the tribulation. I think every believer that is alive will go through these difficult events leading to the tribulation. I believe Christ will come and remove us after the events of Matthew 24, verses 4 through 8, but before the tribulation happens. Now, this removal of the church is something that uh, we call the rapture. And it's described in 1 Thessalonians uh, 4, verses 16 and 17. <clears throat> And here uh, Paul says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the arch archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive will remain, I'm sorry, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, we shall always be with the Lord. I think this is extremely good news. Uh, I really love reading about the rapture. Um, I really believe it will happen before the true tribulation starts and the followers of Christ will be in heaven worshiping and praising the Lord as the tribulation unfolds on the earth. <clears throat> The rapture will be the final event before the world enters the tribulation. And I believe uh, believers who come to believe in Christ after the rapture will have to endure the tribulation here on earth. And most will not survive. Most will be killed, martyred for their belief. Um, because when the church is raptured, the Holy Spirit dwells in us, lives in us, and, and influences the world through Christians. When the church is raptured and the Christians are removed from the earth, the Holy Spirit is also removed, and evil will run unchecked. It will be a very difficult time to live. But as I go back and I read Thessalonians 4, um, one of the things that pops out to me is verse 17. When we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. I'm sorry. The end of verse 6, I'll read the whole thing. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So we have hope that we will be reunited with all those uh, people ahead of us that have believed in Christ, that have passed away. The dead in Christ will rise first, our, fa our parents, our grandparents, all of our ancestors, um, the Old Testament and New Testament saints, they will all be a part of the rapture. And then verse 17, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. 
So the good news is we will be raptured before the tribulation starts. We will be spending eternity with the Lord, <coughs> with all the believers. <coughs> I'm sorry, my voice is cracking. With all the believers who have gone before us <coughs> and all the believers who are living at the time of the rapture. <coughs> Pardon me. This is great news. So this is the end of the introduction to Revelation. Next, next uh, lesson we're going to pick up with Revelation chapter 1. So please read chapter 1 before looking at the next video. Um, there's some great things in chapter 1, including a nice outline of the book of Revelation and the blessing for us that read and study the book of Revelation. Thank you for tuning in, and uh, please uh, come back and visit us again for lesson number two. Thanks a lot. Good night.